Hey everybody, David Ansardi back here again, and I am going to give you a couple of lectures on bone growth and development. I apologize when I first made this PowerPoint uh, presentation and had that printed for your PowerPoint notebooks that you purchased in the bookstore. Um, and now this is during the fall of 2010, by the way. If you're watching this later, then this has likely been corrected. But fall for fall 2010. Um, I've only got this PowerPoint in one presentation. It's going to be divided up into two lectures. And then unfortunately I realized later I needed to add a few slides in and cover a little bit more material in this lecture than I originally anticipated. So for fall 2010, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create those uh, PowerPoint pages for you that you can print out yourself at home and uh, go ahead and print those out. They'll be available in, in your Unit 3 section on Blackboard. And uh, you know, print those out and substitute those for the ones that are in your PowerPoint notebook that you purchased from the bookstore. After fall, 2002, uh, after fall 2010, hopefully that's been corrected and it won't be a, a problem for you. All right, let me get started here. And hopefully you're not getting blinded too much by the shiny light bouncing off my forehead. I was just taking a look at that a minute ago on the camera screen over there, and it was pretty bright. Hang on, y'all know the drill. i got to get my pen going here. All right, so I'm going to talk to you guys about bone growth and development. And before we do that, though, I need to, there's some terminology um, that you're going to hear about throughout the whole unit that I need to talk about. Um, and then we'll uh, discuss bone growth and development. So obviously you guys know what growth means, uh, bones getting larger over time. Development, though, is actually going to refer to processes that start in the embryo and the fetus while you're in the womb, um, where tissues, softer types of connective tissue convert over to bony tissue through a process called osteogenesis or ossification. So that's what we're going to be talking about with regards to the development of the bones of the skeletal system. Okay, so as I mentioned, there's some terminology we need to go through first. Uh, so you'll be familiar with this before we start talking about the, the gory details of skeletal system development. Um, Bones can be classified, bones throughout the skeletal system can be classified according to their shape. So you'll hear some of these terms quite a bit as you're going through the unit, and you'll hear about these in lab as well. Um, there are a number of bones in the skeletal system that are classified as flat bones, and as the name suggests, these are bones whose shape more or less uh, is flat. And where do you have those? Your sternum, right in here, that's a flat bone. And then up here in the skull, many of the, your, the bones of your skull that cover the cranial cavity, and then also some of your facial bones as well, are flat bones. Um, the other bone type you'll hear the most about are the long bones. And for something to be a long bone means it's not pancake flat like the flat bones and it's longer than it is wide. Uh, so obviously, the major bones of your legs, your arms, those are going to be long bones. But even the much smaller bones, like in your fingers, even though some of those, as you'll see in lab, are really, really tiny, uh, they're still longer than they are wide, and so they're still going to be considered long bones. Uh, a couple of other types, short bones. Guess what? Short bones are short and you're going to find those in places like your ankles and in your wrists. You've got lots of short bones there. Uh, and then, well, let's say you've got bones that don't really fit into any of those other shaped categories. You know, they're kind of flat in some places and long in some places, short in others. Those are your irregular bones. So what you see right there is a typical vertebra from, the, from your backbone, from your spinal column. And you can see it has kind of an, um, a mixed shape, and that's why it's called an irregular bone. Okay, so you're going to hear, hear those shape terms quite a bit. 
And then there also are some, uh, there are some terms that are used to describe different parts of a typical long bone. And then some of these apply to the other types of bones as well. Um, but when we're learning these terms, we typically look at a picture of a long bone and learn them in this context. Okay, so this is a generic uh, long bone. Um, actually, this bone is your, your humerus that you're taking a look at here, your upper arm bone. And so it's a long bone. And what do you notice about most long bones have a wider portion at each end? Okay, and then they have a skinnier shaft here in the middle. Okay, so the shaft in the middle, from there to there, that is called the diaphysis. And the wider ends, each of those is called an epiphysis. Okay. And notice here on this diagram from your textbook, uh, a bone will have a proximal epiphysis and a distal epiphysis, uh, and this is using proximal and distal like you learned about in lab in Unit 1, where proximal is closer to the trunk of the body, distal is further away from the trunk. Okay, so you will ha see those terms used quite a bit. I'm going to erase all that stuff. What are some other things that we see on here? Uh, notice at the ends of the epiphyses here, You've got some of this blue tissue that's drawn on there, um, and that is hyaline cartilage. And you're going to have that on the ends of long bones, and they are part of the joints between that bone and adjacent bones, important for some of the cushioning that takes place there composed of hyaline cartilage, which you learned about in Unit 2 when you were studying tissues. And you'll also see this little bit of cartilage that's present on the ends of long bones called articular cartilage. That word articular comes from articulate. Articulate, uh, in this case, and you think about art he or she is... Um, very articulate. They speak well, they join words well together, they combine words well together. And here this term articulate is being used to describe uh, bones coming together to form joints. So when you're studying the skeletal system and you talk about articulation, that's referring to where bones are coming together at joints. So therefore this articular cartilage just means the cartilage on the ends of these long bones that's present at a joint. Um, now the official tissue name for that is hyaline cartilage. Articular cartilages are composed of hyaline uh, cartilage. Where have you seen hyaline cartilage before? Uh, the next time you're chewing on some fried chicken, you got that gristle on the end of the chicken bones, that's articular cartilage, which is composed of hyaline cartilage, the gristle. You know it is gristle. Okay, what else have we got going on here that we need to talk about now? Um, notice the center of this long bone here is hollow in the middle. That hollow portion is called the medullary cavity. And the medullary cavity is going to be filled with marrow. Uh, very early in life in long bones, that marrow will be red marrow. And red marrow is the site of bone cell formation. That's where your red blood cells and your white blood cells are actually formed in that red marrow. In your long bones, though, as you get older, that red marrow gets converted over to yellow marrow. And yellow marrow is fatty, so it's largely composed of adipose tissue. Uh, now, within that medullary cavity, you also have blood vessels, nerves, lymphatic vessels passing through there as well. Because as you guys will see, 
uh, you know, you tend to think of bones as being like stone, dead, but no. Uh, osseous tissue, and that term osseous refers to bone. Osseous tissue uh, has a very rich blood supply. It uh, contains many living cells, uh, so it's a very vigorously active, metabolically active type of tissue. So don't think of think of it as being some kind of dead piece of stone just because it's a bone. Uh, a couple of other things we need to talk about on here. Do you see here how they're kind of highlighting this portion of the long bone along part of the diaphysis there? On the next slide, I'm going to zoom in there. Okay, so we're zooming in just on a part of the diaphysis. And notice in here they're, they've got a big hunk of yellow marrow passing through there. Um, okay, do you see here where they've got this term endosteum? Uh, that is a connective tissue lining. And it covers the medullary cavity. It's also a location where some of the cells that are involved in forming bone, repairing bone, tend to hang out. So they really don't have that drawn in on this diagram. But imagine there along lining that cavity there, you've got a connective tissue membrane or covering there. Now notice here on the outside of the bone, you have a connective tissue covering there as well. That's called the periosteum. Peri referring to something that surrounds something else. Oste or osteo is always going to refer to bone. The periosteum is the connective tissue covering around the outside of bones. And you don't just have that on, on long bones, you have that on other bones as well. Uh, notice here in this picture, do you see how they're peeling off this blue strip of tissue? Uh, that represents, that's supposed to be a representation of the periosteum covering uh, around this bone. Notice if you look really closely at the picture, it's got lots of blood vessels passing through it, so it is rich in blood vessels. And you also have some of these cells that are very important for bone formation and bone breakdown, bone repair, etc. They hang out within that connective tissue covering as well. Uh, the next time you're eating barbecue ribs, you might notice some flaky tissue on the outside, <laughs> something that's kind of crusty on the outside of the bones that's flaking off, and that is your barbecued periosteum from, that, uh, from those bones that's flaking off. See, I always like to bring up food in these, uh, in these lectures. I must be hungry. Uh, notice also out here on the outside of the bone, you've got these arteries called nutrient arteries that are coming in from the tissues on the outside of the bone and passing into the bony matrix itself. Uh, so as you've heard by now, bony tissue has a rich blood supply. The cells in that tissue are very active, so they need a constant source of oxygen and nutrients, and they need their wastes uh, carried away uh, that they generate. So you've got to have a good blood supply to make that happen. Okay, so I just wanted to show you those. Don't forget those, some of those terms. They're going to come up over and over again. Okay, so what about the osseous tissue itself? Um, throughout the body, osseous tissue can be divided up into two types. Um, you have spongy bone and compact bone. And as is not uncommon when you're learning anatomy, uh, there are multiple terms for each of these types of bones. I usually refer to spongy bone as spongy bone, but you may also see it referred to as trabecular bone uh, and cancellous bone. So those are two other terms you may run across. Okay, why is this type of bone called trabecular bone? That's because this type of bone, it, does, it actually does look like a sponge. You'll see some examples of this in the lab, if, especially if you look at our, uh, the few examples of real human bones that we have in the lab versus the models. Um, 
it really does look spongy and it's built from little pieces of osseous tissue that more alike look like T's in terms of their structure and each of those T's is called a trabecula. Now they're not perfect little T's but they kind of more or less look like T's that get put together. Um, the plural of that term is trabeculi or trabeculi with a with an AE on the end instead of just an A. So all these little T-shaped structures get linked together and when that happens what you see over here, so here's a a photograph of some actual spongy bone that's coming from one of the the bones of the skull. So if you look over here, they're kind of highlighting. You got a sagittal section that's been made through the skull. You're zooming in on a side view of one of the skull bones. And if you look in there, and do this in the lab too, take a look at these in the lab. If you look in there, most of the bony tissue that you're looking at from the side has a spongy look. And if you zoom in really, really closely, this is what it would look like here. And you can kind of see you've got those T-shaped structures that are being linked together to make that spongy bone. And those are called trabecul trabeculi or trabeculi. And those are the subunits, the building blocks of the spongy bone. Now over here, you've got a cartoon diagram that's showing this in a little bit more detail. Um, so you're looking at like a little wedge-shaped piece of bone here, and there's your spongy bone. Notice that next to it, towards the edge of the bone, you have the other bone type called compact bone. We'll talk more about that in, in a second. And this little blue covering that you see there, that's supposed to be the periosteum, the connective tissue covering. Okay, so osseous tissue does have cells in it. Okay, those cells are called osteocytes, the mature bone cells, and they are actually entrapped inside that solid bone matrix that Dr. Pratham talked to you about on your last video lecture. So they're sitting in there inside the bone matrix. So if you were zooming in here, you'd have an osteocyte there, 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 scattered around. Uh, now in the lab, you see all these spaces within the spongy bone. Uh, in your body, that's not filled with air or just fluid. It's actually filled with red bone marrow. Within those spaces. Those spaces have red bone marrow. Oh, well, never mind. I already had that written here on the slide, but so I wrote it again, just not quite as neatly. You also have blood vessels passing through there as well because all those cells there that are sitting there in the bone matrix need a source of nutrients and, and oxygen. Where do you have spongy bone? Down here on the bottom, flat bones. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, the flat bones, the epiphyses of long bones, so the widened ends, uh, then in the ribs and in your uh, vertebrae along your backbone. Okay, that's spongy bone. Now what about the compact bone? My pen is not behaving for me now. Let's see. I think my pen went off. Okay. Uh, compact bone. This is the other type of bone. And uh, like spongy bone, it has an additional name, lamellar bone, and we'll see why that is in a minute. Uh, now this, unlike spongy bone, where you have all those spaces between the trabeculae that are filled with red marrow, blood vessels, etc., in compact bone, the bony matrix lacks spaces. So it's just bone matrix, bone matrix, bone matrix, bone matrix, with cells arranged in there as well. And this matrix is actually arranged in rings that kind of look like tree rings. Those rings are called lamellae or, or lamellae. Lamella is singular, and that's where this bone gets its name, lamellar bone. And those rings that kind of look like the rings of a, a tree trunk that you're looking at cut open, uh, they form a subunit 
of compact bone that's called an osteon. So like the trabeculae, the little T-shaped things are considered to be the subunits, the things that are linked together to build spongy bone. These are the subunits that are linked together to build your compact bone that has little space. Uh, it's just filled completely with matrix. If you look over here at, um, on this diagram, we got a generic long bone here, and they're zooming in just on a little portion here, like a little wedge-shaped piece of the long bone. Um, okay, so what you see here, this little portion right in here, that is the part of the bone that is lining or next to the medullary cavity. So you got that space in the middle that's filled with yellow marrow. Uh, the space is covered with the endosteum. Then if you go outward from the endosteum, you have a little bit of this spongy bone like they're showing you there. Move outward from there and you have a pretty thick layer of this compact bone. So all of this is compact bone. And you see how you've got these kind of circular shaped structures in there. Those are the osteons. And here what they're showing you is how, um, if you could do this, you could almost telescope these uh, lamellae, the little ring-shaped structures out like this. So you've got one little ring-shaped structure, another one outward from there, another one outward from there. And then all swirled together, they make up one osteon. Okay. Yeah, let's zoom in on this next slide. What I'm going to do is show you some of the features of an osteon by kind of zooming in on like a little wedge-shaped piece of just one of these subunits. Okay, and that's what we see here. We're looking at just one little wedge-shaped piece of an osteon. So there's one ring, one lamella. Here's another one. Here's another one. And they're all moving outward from an open center, a little canal in the middle. That's called the central canal. That central canal has a vein in it. It has an artery in it. It has a nerve in it. All of those things are necessary to supply the cells that are hanging out in that bony matrix in these lamellae. Okay, I'm going to erase those. So where are the cells in here? Here's one cell. Here's another one over here. Here's another one over here. Here's another one over here. Those cells are all in one lamella, and then you move out to the next lamella. There's a cell. There's another one. There's another one. Those cells are called osteocytes, osteobone site cell. And, okay, so they're sitting there in that bony matrix, but there's a little tiny bit of space around them. That little tiny bit of space is called a lacuna. Uh, and you heard about lacun lacuni or lacunae uh, back in Unit 2 when you were learning about cartilage because the chondrocytes, the cartilage cells, hang out in, in those little chambers as well. And then I want you to also notice on this diagram these cells have these little projections that are extending off of them. Those are little tiny extensions of their cytoplasms that reach out and touch the cells in the next lamellae, the adjacent lamellae. And that winds up being really, really important for nutrient exchange, oxygen exchange, removal of wastes for these cells. These cells need a, a rich blood supply. Uh, the blood is being delivered here by the artery in the central canal. Okay, These cells in that first ring, they have those little extensions that they send out, so they're able to absorb nutrients and oxygen from that artery. They bring it into these cells. They pass it through the, these extensions to the cells in the next layer. They pass it through their little extensions to the cells in the next layer, etc. So by that working like that, the cells in all of the lamellae have a good supply of oxygen and nutrients. Um, also, the wastes will be sent out. Okay, so 
waste products and so forth are being uh, generated in all of these cells. And those are passed through those little extensions to the cells in the next layers. And they're transferred over and those wastes and so forth will enter the vein here and be carried away. So because of the way this is laid out, all of these cells have a good supply of oxygen and nutrients, even the ones that are a pretty far distance from the blood supply there. Uh, this term you might hear, those little extensions that are passing between cells in the compact bone, they've got to have little tiny canals that they pass through. Uh, and those are called canaliculi, which that's a really fun term to say. Singular is canaliculus, plural canaliculi. That's the little tiny canals that those extensions pass through in the, in the bony matrix. And I'm going to go back again over here. And notice, so a lot of the compact bone is arranged in those ring-shaped osteons. Um, and then when you get at towards the very edge of the bone. You don't really have those osteons anymore. You have what are called circumferential lamellae. So you just have a few um, lamellae that extend all the way around the outside of the long bone at that point. Um, you have a few of those. And then as you move inward from there, you start running into these osteons that are all kind of hooked together to make the rest of that um, compact bone and the long bone. All right, so I'm going to stop this first part of the lecture on bone growth and development there, and we'll pick up with the rest of the story in the next one.